So our topic for today then, probably for the next couple of sessions, is a second very famous, indeed even more famous, part of Mill's essay, Utilitarianism, uh, chapter four, where Mill discusses the possibility of a proof of the principle of utility. The third paragraph, actually, of this chapter is one of the most famous, discussed, criticized paragraphs in the whole of philosophy. There are dozens, at least, of uh, articles published in philosophical journals devoted essentially to the interpretation of this paragraph. And that being so, you know, you, you would anticipate that it's not entirely a straightforward matter. We'll turn to that key paragraph in just a sec. Um, before we do so, there are um, two important preliminary lessons to get from what Mill says in the two paragraphs that precede it. Begin with the first paragraph of the proof chapter, so this is uh, page 36 in the right thing to do. In that paragraph, you learn something important about, about the character and about the relative modesty of Mill's ambitions here. So in that first paragraph of the proof chapter, you know, the first paragraph on 36 under the heading of what sort of proof the principle of utility is susceptible, Mill writes as follows. It has already been remarked that questions of ultimate ends do not admit of proof in the ordinary acceptation, that's meaning, of the term. To be incapable of proof by reasoning is common to all first principles to the first premises of our knowledge as well as to those of our conduct. But the former being matters of fact may be the subject of direct appeal to the faculties which judge of fact, namely our senses and our internal consciousness. Can an appeal be made to the same faculties on questions of practical ends? Or by what other faculty is cognizance taken of them? See, if you look at that paragraph, especially write the first half of it, right? Mill is very clear that he's not going to be able to offer here, what we ordinarily mean by a proof. And he's got a clear reason for that, right? The picture Mill has, right, is that what a proof, strictly speaking, involves is deducing something from some prior first principle. So to prove anything other than a first principle, you um, have an argument for it which involves in some way deducing it from a first principle and so you prove it. But look, I mean, given that picture of the nature of proof, it's not going to be possible to prove a first principle, right? I mean, a first principle is the kind of thing you use to prove something else. And given that picture of the structure of, and character of proof, there is no way to give what's strictly speaking a proof of anything that aspires to be a first principle. So Mill is clear that what he's going to be able to offer here cannot be a proof, strictly speaking. It must be something else. Right? And he makes some suggestions, that less clear, and we won't go into those now, um, about just what that something else might be in the latter half of the paragraph. So that's the first thing. That's about, you know, sort of what what his ambition is, what he thinks he can do. Right. The second thing you need to be clear about here is just what Mill sets out to prove, or, you know, I mean, prove in quotation marks or something, right, because it's not strictly speaking proof, but what, is, what it is he sets out to establish. Put another way, how he characterizes and understands the utilitarian view that he sets out to offer considerations in favor of. Here, it's instructive to look at the second paragraph of the proof chapter. And it's actually, it's instructive to compare it with what Mill says earlier in the book, in, in a place which is also in our extract. So begin with what he says in 
the um, that second paragraph of the proof chapter. He, re he says, questions about ends are, in other words, questions about what things are desirable. The utilitarian doctrine is that happiness is desirable and the only thing desirable as an end, all other things being only desirable as means to that end. So that's what he says by way of characterizing the utilitarian doctrine or view he sets out to prove. So it's, it's instructive then to compare that with what he says in defining utilitarianism earlier in the book. Actually, this is the very first um, sentence of our extract back on page 30. There on 30, he says, <coughs> The creed which accepts as the foundation of morals utility, or the greatest happiness principle, holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. If you look at those two characterizations in the right way, in particular if you look at them in a way that's informed by the three-part definition of utilitarianism we earlier gave, remember that definition in terms of consequentialism plus hedonism plus an equality principle, you'll see that there's a, there's a quite striking difference. Right? So the thing Mill says at the start of the book, on page 30, right, the definition he gives of utilitarianism there seems to involve consequentialism. It involves the idea that, as he puts it, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness. Right? By contrast, if you look at the, that second paragraph of the proof chapter on page 36, there's no such reference to consequentialism at all. There's no reference to the rightness of actions being a product of the goodness of their consequences. The utilitarian doctrine, as he characterizes it here in the proof chapter, is simply about what things are good or desirable as ends. It's simply the view that happiness is desirable and the only thing desirable as an end. So if you um, look again at that char three-part characterization we gave of utilitarianism, it looks as though when he sets out to prove utilitarianism, Mill is really only focused on hedonism, or perhaps hedonism plus the equality principle. And it's really not, doesn't look as though he's thinking about taking himself to need to prove, offer evidence for consequentialism at all. It's probably worth my reminding you just a minute of the, the three-part definition. Um, you've got this down in, in, in your notes earlier, so I'm not going to leave this PowerPoint up for a great period of time, but it's probably worth having you just refresh your memory, right? So in terms of this, look, the point I just made is in earlier points in the essay Utilitarianism, when Mill defines the utilitarian view, the definition seems to include consequentialism. But in the proof chapter, when he explains what he aims to prove, the definition of utilitarianism he gives does not appear to include consequentialism. It appears only to include hedonism and possibly the equality principle. All right, we can um, revert to that view, yeah. Flick through, through some PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. So, um, with those two preliminaries on board, we're now in a position to approach the argument of this very famous paragraph. Right? So, like I said, I mean, this is terribly famous, much discussed, much criticized, and of course, you know, it wouldn't be like that if it were pellucidly clear, if it were immediately obvious exactly how the argument was supposed to go, then people wouldn't have to, you know, you know spill all this ink discussing it, right? Still, 
you know, what we have to try and do is get, a, get at least a take on how it works, right? Now, let's be clear what position we're in here, okay? Because there are two questions we want to ask about this argument, but it's, it's a different set of two questions, right? So there's two situations you can be in with arguments. Either you've got them formulated or you haven't. Right? If you've got them formulated, then you've got, you already know what the premises and the conclusion are. Right? And if you've got a formulated argument, our two questions are, is it valid and are the premises true? Right? But sometimes when you're interpreting a piece of philosophical work, you're not that far along. Right? You don't know how to formulate the argument yet. Yeah? If you don't know how to formulate it, then there's sort of a different two questions you want to ask. You want to ask, what's the conclusion, and what are the premises? Ultimately put, what's the conclusion, how do we get there? Right? The how do we get there version gives you a way of sort of sketching roughly how it works without necessarily being able explicitly to state all the premises, right? But, you know, step in the right direction. Anyway. And it's those two questions. What's the conclusion, what are the premises, what's the conclusion, how do we get there, that I'm going to ask you guys once I've read you this very famous third paragraph, okay? So, in this paragraph, the final par full paragraph on 36, Mill writes as follows. He says, <coughs> The only proof capable of being given that an object is visible is that people actually see it. The only proof that a sound is audible is that people hear it and so of the other sources of our experience. In like manner, I apprehend, the sole evidence it is possible to produce that anything is desirable is that people do actually desire it. If the end which the utilitarian doctrine proposes to itself were not, in theory and in practice, acknowledged to be an end, nothing could ever convince any person that it was so. No reason can be given why the general happiness is desirable except that each person, so far as he believes it to be attainable, desires his own happiness. This, however, being a fact, we have not only all the proof which the case admits of, but all which it is possible to require that happiness is a good, that each person's happiness is a good to that person, and the general happiness, therefore, a good to the aggregate of all persons. Happiness has made out its title as one of the ends of conduct, and consequently one of the criteria of morality. All right, so let's then consider those interpretive questions. Begin with the first one. Oh, no, 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 back, back, back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, begin with the first one, which is the question, what's the conclusion? Where, where, where is he trying to get to? Look at the passage. What's, what's, your, what's your one show? I think, I think he's trying to say that happiness is only a part of morality, it's not all of morality. I can see why, I mean, that's, you're doing something sensible there, you say that happiness is only a part of morality. Um, uh, that is, you're looking for a conclusion in a sensible place, that is, at the end, right? Um, and you're right that... Um, He thinks there's something more you've got to do once, if, once you've made the argument of this paragraph work connected to that, which we'll get to. Um, but, I mean, the emphasis for him is, is not on happiness is only one of the criteria of morality. It's that happiness is one, right? I mean, it, if, if you put it that way. Um, I actually um, prefer the penultimate sentence. That's the, you know, the second last one, as a place to get the um, conclusion, right? Um, so there he says, right, this however being a fact, we have not only all the proof which the case admits of, but all which is possible to require that happiness is good, that each person's happiness is a good to that person, and the general happiness, therefore, a good to the aggregate of all persons. So I think that, you know, the best thing you can get from the paragraph as a statement of the conclusion is the claim that the general happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons. 
I can explain the stuff in the final sentence to you if you like, but it involves more, more stuff about Mill's sort of general theoretical setup, which may just be confusing. Okay, so if that's the conclusion, the conclusion is general happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons. We come to the, the other interpretive question, namely sort of what are the premises? What are the moves? How do we get there? So what, what evidence is Mill relying on here to support the claim that the general happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons? What do you think? Yes? Is it that uh, each person believes happiness is attainable, so they seek out their own happiness? Um, I, I would say roughly. I mean, so certainly one premise is that each person desires their own happiness. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that's certainly one key point. Um, so what do we have to add to that? Right. So that's... Um, that's a factual claim about what people actually desire. What, what, what do we have to add to that to get from being desired to being desirable? Which is fairly explicit in the early part of the paragraph. Take on that. I mean, I mean, again, you see the see the point. Right? I mean, it's one thing for to say that people actually desire something. It's another thing to say it's desirable or good. So, how does Mill make the connection? There? Yes. Uh, that something is desirable because we actually desire it. He does, and he, I mean, he, he has particular ways of saying that, right? He has he has this comparison between desirability on the one hand and visibility and audibility on the other at the beginning. And he says explicitly, right, having articulated those comparisons, he says, the sole evidence it is possible to produce that anything is desirable is that people do actually desire it. Right? So he's got a, he's a claim there about the explicitly linking being desired to being desirable. Right? So look, um, put those two things together. The, the claim that each person desires his or her own happiness, and the claim that you know the sole evidence is possible to produce that something's desirable is that people actually desire it. Then you get the claim to so the claim roughly that um, each person each person's own happiness is desirable, or perhaps for him or her. What other move is in here? What what's the other key step? I mean, if one key step is from being desired to being desirable, what's the other thing going on? Look, look more in the latter half of the paragraph now. Indeed, in that penultimate sentence. I might put it this way, does Mill simply want to sh show that each person's happiness is desirable for him or her? If not, what further thing does he want to show? Yeah? I think he's trying to say that everyone's happiness is also good to everyone. Yes. So look, so the other key move so one key move is a move from being desired to being desirable. The other key move is a move, as you might say, from the individual to the general, right? Yeah, I think that's right. So um, if you put all that together, you can get a, you know, at least a tentative formulation supposed to um, capture the basic character of the argument. And we, we could go to the PowerPoint at, at this stage.
see how that is then. So um, pr premise one then is sort of the first premise we identified, right? Then two is the premise that um, involves the move from being desired to being desirable. Three draws a conclusion from that premise. And then the move from three to four is the move from the individual to the general. Let me say one other thing about how this formulation works. I've put stuff in brackets, parentheses. Here's the idea. You get, in effect, two ways to read the argument. Either read it including the bracketed stuff everywhere, you know, in all the premises and conclusions, or read it excluding the bracketed stuff everywhere okay so it's a way of you know capturing two different versions of the formulation in a you know a single written thing All right, so everyone's got that, and everyone both understands how the bracketed stuff works, right? And understands the character of the argument again. One's that initial pretty uncontroversial factual premise. Two involves the key move from being desired to being desirable. Three's the intermediate conclusion, and the move from three to four is the move from the individual to the general. So now we got we got a formulated argument, right? So once we've got a formulated argument, what two questions do we ask? These are the more familiar ones. <laughs> yeah, is it valid? Are the premises true? Yes, yes, that's right. So start with the validity question: Is it valid? And the answer here actually is yes and no. Right, in this sense. Um, three follows from one and two, four does not follow from three. As, as we have it written, you can validly get to three from one and two, but not to four. Um, if it were A less famous, tricky, interpretably controversial, interesting argument than Mill's proof, we might at that point say, oh well, there we are, doesn't work. Um, it being Mill's proof, however, I think the better attitude is to keep that fact about the initial par apparent formulation in mind while we go through 
the process of considering famous criticisms of the argument with the idea that maybe in the process of thinking about these criticisms we'll see how you might in effect um, fix up the argument sort of implicitly add something that would allow you to get from three to As I said, um, this is a much criticized argument. And the criticisms um, started appearing you know, very soon after uh, this was first published in 1861. Probably the most famous critic, they're not, you know, certainly, as I said, by no means the earliest, but the most famous is. Uh, the 20th century philosopher G. E. Moore, especially in his very celebrated 1903 book Principia Ethica, which despite its Latin title is, is written in English, um, Moore is in various ways highly critical of Mill and in particular highly critical of Mill's proof. And um, I guess, um, well, two or three of the four criticisms that we will look at uh, have very famous sort of Morian uh, versions or expressions. To preview, actually, what I'll do is, is we'll consider a total of four criticisms. Criticisms. Um, so the first couple, I'm going to suggest, actually, that you can make some decent responses on Mill's behalf, and these are ones associated with more. But I'll suggest that there are um, a couple of other problems, very important problems, to which there is no available compelling response. Um, so, begin with probably the most famous of these criticisms. So, um, it's the most famous one because um, it's sort of most famously associated with Moore's own positive project in Principia Ethica, right? In accusing Mill of making this first key mistake, what Moore does is he makes Mill a kind of um, paradigm example of a sort of philosophical mistake that Moore thinks is very widespread. Right? Let me tell you what Moore says, and then I'll give you, you know, something to write down in your notes. But let me give you a flavor first. Okay. So what Moore says is, Mill makes a terrible error in trying to get in, you know, the, as we had it, the second premise of the argument, from something's being desired to his being desi it's being desirable. Specifically, Moore says, Mill is... Um, fundamentally misled in relying on this analogy between visibility and audibility on the one hand and desirability on the other. Because right? what Moore says is, look, to be visible is to be capable of being seen. I mean, that's what visible means. Right? To be audible, that's to be capable of being heard. So, the fact that someone sees something really does prove that it's visible, right? The fact that someone hears something really does prove that it's audible. And Mill, as Moore pictures him, takes it that that means, you know, the same thing works with desirability, right? So the fact that someone desires something proves it's desirable. But then Moore says, look, desirable doesn't have a meaning that's in this way analogous to the meanings of visible and audible, right? Because desirable does not mean
capable of being desired. It means instead worthy of being desired or good. Right? So you cannot legitimately infer that something's desirable from the fact that people desire it in the way that you can legitimately infer that something's visible from the fact that people see it. So, as Moore sees it, this whole move from being desired to being desirable is, is kind of a fundamental mistake. Right. Got something. Here we are. Um, so I think we, we actually we have a, have a look at this. Yeah, we got we got a a longish um, well two part PowerPoint where I'm articulating this very famous Morian criticism. Okay, and I've also got a reference to the the big Moore book and the the date and stuff. Okay, here we go. Let me know when you're done with this PowerPoint, and then we'll go to the, the one that completes it. Right. Everyone ready for slide two?
All right. As I indicated, I think there are things you can say to um, get Mill to defend Mill against this criticism. Um, to do so, I think, I mean, you've got to acknowledge that there's something problematic about what Mill says, and that he doesn't convey his ideas in the best way, right? In particular, I think you ought to acknowledge that the idea at the start of the paragraph of an analogy between visibility and audibility on the one hand, desirability on the other, really is problematic. But having said that, I think you can actually in a couple of different ways say Mill doesn't really need to rely on that analogy and he actually has some quite sensible things to, se to say or you know there is more that he could sensibly say to defend the move from being desired to being desirable. There are actually there's two ways to do this. The, here's, here's the one that's, that may be sort of easier to understand, right? Um, here what you, um, what you rely on is that um, sentence or whatever it is, sentence fragment I already drew your attention to where uh, Mill says, the sole evidence it's possible to reduce that, that anything is desirable is that people do actually desire it, right? So you say, look, I mean, Mill's making a claim here about what sort of evidence you could produce for something being desirable. And he says, well, look, as it were, the best evidence I can think of is that the people actually desire it. And you can say, and he's really on pretty strong ground there, right? Because if you're trying to show that something's desirable or good, I mean, what more, what better could you do than to show that people do desire it? I mean, you know, it, you have to admit that, that it doesn't, that showing that people desire it doesn't amount to sort of a logical proof that it's desirable, but still, you, you might ask, what, what, what other sorts of evidence or um, facts could you hope to reduce in favour? Right. Now, on that way of, as it were, depicting the response on Mill's behalf to Moore's criticism, yeah? um, you, you, what you say is, yes, Mill really is making a move from being desired to being desirable. It is a move from the factual to the evaluative. But once you see it aright, I mean, all right, it doesn't work the way the move from being seen to being visible does. But still, you know, he's on strong ground in saying that the best evidence you can have for something being desirable is, or good is that people actually desire it. That's one way to see it. The other way to see it is to, and, and to defend Mill here, is to say, really, he doesn't move from being desired to being desirable. You know, so in, in that way, the way we formulated the argument would actually be m misleading, right? On this way of seeing what's going on, what, the way you see Mill's argument is this, you say, look, um, he's making um, an argument that involves appealing to the evaluative beliefs that people already have. So the idea he here is, in order to show that something is desirable or good, the only thing you can really do is appeal to what people think about that, right? You can, the, on, the only thing you can do is appeal to people's beliefs about what's desirable or good, right? And that's what's going on when he says the whole evidence it's possible to reduce that something is desirable as the people do actually desire it, right? It's not a move from the factual to the evaluative, it's rather a move of 
um, as it were, attempting to get people to accept certain evaluative conclusions by appealing to the evaluative beliefs that they already have. Right? I, I actually sort of somewhat prefer the second way of doing it, but I mean, the point is either way there's something to be said here, right? Either way you've got a reply to Moore's criticism. I mean, the, and in both cases, the, the criticism has the, the reply involves saying, sure, there's something misleading about that first bit, there's something misleading about that audibility, audibility visibility analogy stuff, but when you think about it, there's still something sensible to be said on Mill's behalf, defending the move, defending the um, his idea about how you uh, justify support judgments of desirability. So that's a first criticism. A second criticism, again one that um, Moore and others um, articulate, is one we've already in effect taken note of just in you know, our, our brief initial remarks about the validity of the argument. Right? What this second criticism, and again I'll do the same thing, I'll, I'll state it and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll give you some, a, a PowerPoint with, with a version of it. Um, what this second criticism targets is the move from the individual to the general. The person making this criticism says, look, I mean, the best you properly get out of this argument is a justification of the claim that each person's happiness is a good to or for that person. Right? But look, that's the kind of thing that an ethical egoist believes. And there's no way to get from that sort of thing, the thing that an ethical egoist believes, that each person's happiness is good to him or her, to this utilitarian thing that Mill wants to get, the idea that the general happiness is valuable, or perhaps valuable to everyone. All right. So, here's a, here's a PowerPoint that, then with a, a a version of this criticism.
All right. Um, here again, I think there is a good response available on Mill's behalf. And actually, in this case, there's uh, some interesting textual evidence from outside utilitarianism that this is the way Mill would want to go. Um, it is in making this response that it's important to um, bear in mind the issue that arose with respect to our initial formulation of the argument. That is, the issue whether to include the bracketed stuff or to exclude it. Because right. see, the thing to notice is this. If you go with the formulation as we initially had it, um, including the bracketed stuff. We maybe pop back to the PowerPoint just a sec here. This is the PowerPoint, something you've already got, so you don't need to write this down again. But look, I mean, if you read it including the bracketed stuff, right, then it really does look like there's this big jump from three to four, right? I mean, how do you get from the claim that each person's happiness is desirable for him or her to the claim that the general happiness is desirable for everyone, right? Include the bracketed stuff looks very dicey. But, see how it looks if you exclude the bracketed stuff, which I've now done, right? I mean, this is, this is just, you know, the same thing, except I haven't even, you know, included the bracketed stuff on this slide, right? Now, the move from three to four looks much less troubling, right? Because now what three says is that each person's happiness is desirable or good. Desirable or good, period. Not just desirable or good for him or her. You know, it, it, it sort of, it's a good thing that each person be happy. And then you can say, well, look, I mean, the move from three to four is sort of like um, saying, you know, if each of the elements that compose a whole is, is itself desirable, then the whole is desirable. If each of the units of which a sum is made up is desirable, then the sum as a whole is desirable. Okay, we could switch back to the other view. Um, and the thing about this, you see, is that, as I said, that there's um, textual evidence that that was the way Mill himself saw it. Right? There's this um, letter to a fellow called Henry Jones, where Mill comments on this individual to general criticism of the proof and um, I, I forget exactly how he puts it but it, I mean he puts, you know it's just this idea that we've been focusing on he says look I mean all I really meant was you know if each of these individual elements that make up a sum is desirable then the sum as a whole is desirable right so again I mean despite the sort of initial appeal of um, this criticism, I do think there's something effective that Mill can say in response to it, too. Okay. So, the first two criticisms then are one that I think, you know, you can see why someone will make them, but you can also see that Mill has a good response to them. I think that there are two more issues where um, there isn't a good response. One of them Mill has a response, but I don't think it's good, and the other one, he doesn't have a response. Um, but let's turn to those after a break.